So our third session will be talking about AI in healthcare and um, with the objective of bringing awareness of the advancement of technology in uh, the healthcare sector. For now, I'll pass it over to the moderator, Scott, uh, the president of Taylor School of Biosciences Club. And the keynote speaker for this session is Mr. Ng, who is a senior medical lecturer in University Malaya and is a visiting Yale University um, faculty member. So I'll pass this time over to Scott. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Technophilia's first keynote session, which will be introducing AI in healthcare. And it will be taken over by our keynote speaker, Dr. Key. Dr. Key. Hi, thanks to all of you for inviting me and thanks Scott for the introduction. Um, just to kick off the session, I would just like uh, to see if all of you could join me in just putting in a few uh, words with regards to um, what you think about artificial intelligence. And I'll just give you a few minutes to go about it. Still using slido.com, you have the number there. And uh, please key in what you think. Okay, uh, thanks for all your sharing. And I think if you were keeping track of all the words that were coming out, you can see that it's very varied what you guys think about AI. And I have to say, uh, this is the beauty of AI as well as the uh, difficulty with AI as well, because you know it encompasses ranges through such a wide uh, uh, background. And as you can see here, some of the uh, uh, groups have tried to kind of like delineate what is AI versus we typically analyze. We talk about data analytics. And you can see there are certain clear delineations in terms of how we go about it. And I have to say the delineation is not as clear nowadays because AI is pretty much going into a lot of the areas and also other futuristic areas like the metaverse, we are still exploring at this current point in time. So I'm Key, I'm a senior medical lecturer as what they mentioned, and I have actually been developing with my team of students in UM uh, as well as internationally. Uh, and we actually have built this community of practice, which is focused on digital health platform building and developing currently, where we are trying to incorporate artificial intelligence 
the various ways which we can then hopefully make it a very patient-centric platform by the patients to get empowered and own their own health by utilizing the various facets we are building into the platform itself, by they can control how they go about managing their own healthcare remotely, more importantly, be able to access healthcare from the comfort of their home without having to come to the hospital. So just a quick disclosure, I am funded by UM Deep Tech for this medical startup, and we actually have a few um, uh, uh, collaborators like DT Loves Syndrome Berhad, as well as Happy AI. I'm also receiving funding from NIH Fogarty for uh, the work I'm doing with regards to teaching uh, ethics in UM, as well as uh, looking into implementation science with you. The other thing that uh, uh, I'm involved in uh, essentially are various uh, projects that ranges from medical to surgical as well as field work, while we are actually conducting some mostly health surveys and also medical outreach work. And this has actually brought us to various collaborations, local as well as international collaborators as listed here, and also teaching collaborations, for example, with John Hopkins and uh, Yale University currently. So I will just briefly run through uh, AI in healthcare because it's such a huge topic. I will never be able to cover every facet of it. What I thought I could do is maybe give you a quick introduction. At least you're aware of what's already available out there and how we are actually approaching AI currently, as well as how it has impacted how we look at healthcare in the first place. So just to kick off uh, what we are going to do, uh, I thought what we could do is maybe just uh, have a quick questionnaire. If you're still logged in uh, to the Slido, if you can just quickly uh, answer this simple question by how much you think AI should manage our healthcare. And let me just share the results. Okay, uh, if you're following the results just now, you would see that essentially a lot of you chose essentially in between completely AI and human managed by uh, you were actually, in fact, to some extent, favoring AI. Um, the general surveys that people have done all over the world, most of the times seem to uh, err more towards human management but if you look at this spectrum, artificial narrow intelligence just means like, for example, you want to search for a specific thing and it only does that and helps you to do that only. There's no uh, additional uh, autonomous uh, thinking by the AI machine try to generate even more answers on its own. Whereas when you talk about general intelligence, this is where a lot of Google Analytics have come in especially with uh, Google DeepMind, why not only are they coming up with the standard answers, but also looking into your search history, what you have a preference in, they are also trying to uh, predict what you might actually be more interested in and using that data, 
then try to come up with a much more uh, usable list of answers that you are potentially looking for without you even asking in the first place. And on the other end is where we are thinking about like Tesla. They have a completely autonomous uh, uh, guidance for cars where all you have to do is essentially log in and sit in the car and tell the car where to go and you don't have to think about any of the driving and it will get you there from point A to point B. So when it comes to artificial intelligence in healthcare, it has in fact progressed from science fiction where, you know, um, I'm not too sure whether if you guys are familiar, but uh, some of you may have seen like Star Trek or Star Wars, especially in many, uh, in those early days when they first started. And they already hinted at the possible applications of artificial intelligence at that point in time. Unfortunately, firstly, uh, we were not able to support that due to the lack of infrastructure. But with all the facilities that we have right now, with the really fast advancing technology and uh, hardware currently, as you've seen, even Facebook is moving to the metaverse. And we already see tangible real world applications with regards to AI in healthcare because of all these advances. And these advances have accelerated innovations from what we've seen, improved health outcomes, reduced costs of healthcare, more importantly, increasing healthcare access. And these innovations are not only done all over the world, they are also driven by some of the really big tech companies like IBM and Google, whereby they look into treatment protocol support, drug discovery, even evidence-based diagnosis of diseases, IBM's Watsons. And it is enabling accessible, affordable, and quality healthcare to patients. More importantly, it's starting to transform legacy traditional models of healthcare, doctor-centric to patient-centric in the first place. And this is because WHO has actually published the data that we have currently global shortage of about 70 million healthcare workers. By If you look at all the doctors available currently, it's roughly about four doctors per patient, which is still per thousand patients, which is still very high, because obviously they can't be providing as much service as what the thousand patients would need with those few doctors uh, uh, ratio. And this is worsening due to our exponentially growing population and the fact that it's really expensive to train doctors currently. We are just not keeping up and producing as many doctors as we should cover for the population growth currently. Right now itself, we know from uh, published data, US, Germany, Canada, Australia, and even the UK spend a huge portion of their gross domestic product per year on healthcare. Yet, it has not really truly adopted widely AI use in healthcare. However, the cost and demand for care rising, especially during a COVID pandemic, there is a clear increasing need for AI. And this has actually uh, driven some of the countries like US by their increasing AI adoption with legislations, with enforcements of electronic health coding platforms. And in the NHS in UK, they have started using AI-based chatbots to actually uh, resolve the emergency triage process, reduce the workload in emergency departments. And there's also increasing startups in AI in healthcare. For example, DeepMind, which was bought by Google, Havana bought by Intel, and even Thermo Fisher Scientific AI, which is a AI power tool for research publication search, which we'll talk about later. So there are some challenges to adopting AI as we know, because there's actually still a paucity of electronic health records worldwide. Even in Malaysia, to be fair, it's only, for example, uh, uh, some of our major hospitals like UM, 
KM and also Flyang and Sungai Buloh that have actually implemented fully electronic health records. As the majority of our health services like GHKL, for example, despite being a really large hospital, the implementation of a fully electronic health records is still not quite there. And there's also this fear of potentially losing healthcare jobs, but this is not really supported by the data because especially with the pandemic, we've shown that wider adoption of AI in healthcare, in fact, produce much better profits and increase efficiency whereby more new jobs will be created and have been created because of the pandemic. And this resistance to new technology, especially on the doctor's side of things, also partially because of medical legal reasons, due to the fact that uh, all doctors, unfortunately, when they're seeing patients, at the end of the day, will still be putting their license at risk, no matter what technology you're using. Because of that, they still prefer the more traditional system by the fully responsible and uh, analyzing everything on their own rather than relying on technology. But what we've seen is because of the pandemic, it has made it much more necessary for AI adoption. And a state in Spain, Catalonia, has seen with their existing teleconsultation system, which was already in place, luckily for them, even before the pandemic, rise from 18,000 per year to 100,000 teleconsultations. In fact, face-to-face -face consultation has dropped from 150,000 per year only 22,000 during the COVID uh, 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 period. This is actually something very uh, uh, good in terms of looking at how well they've adopted to uh, AI as well as teleconsultation and also digital health platforms. And it's really encouraging to see that once you make technology available, a lot of patients may potentially choose it in the first place. Some other uh, areas whereby it has actually impacted that company quite a bit is, for example, the Frito Lay Snack Foods manufacturer, where, which has ramped up its digital and data driven initiatives. They, what they did was they, in fact, compressed five years' worth of digital plans to six months to make sure they are now much more data-driven and are able to utilize their AI to manage all of these things remotely rather than having still a lot of physical management on board. And there are some other studies done by, for example, Pricewaterhouse, Pricewaterhouse Coopers, one of the big four accounting companies, where they've shown 52% of companies in fact, accelerated their AI adoption plans because of the COVID crisis. 86% of them have made AI their mainstream technology in 2021, uh, continue to expand and invest in AI for the long term. On top of that, in the States, Cognizant's Jobs of the Future Index showed there is currently strong recovery for the jobs market in 2021, especially those involving the technology sector. And in fact, as a 28% increase jobs with regards to AI algorithms and automations. From the academician's perspective, a lot of the AI needs to be driven, unfortunately, by research. But the good news is that if you can see uh, in this slightly busy slide here, in 2005, there were only about 300 papers being published every year with regards to AI. But if you look at it now, just two years ago, it's already hitting almost 8,000 papers per year just in AI alone. And a lot of these papers are being published, for example, in oncology, in pathology, and in radiology. And this is... An even busier slide, I do apologize for that. It's just to kind of like highlight to you how many of this AI technology have already received FDA approval in the States for 
it's artificial intelligence based algorithms to be used in medicine, which means not only have they proven that they are safe to use, are effective, they are now legally licensed to be implemented in uh, healthcare services. And again, the similar areas are still seen by the concentration is mostly in radiology, oncology, as you can see up here in cardiology as well. So AI has evolved to address the gaps in healthcare services. And this is what uh, the earlier discussions were going on, involving, for example, Microsoft, IBM, even Amazon Web Services, where these core platforms implementing AI in health sector supported clinical decision-making, diagnostics, drug discoveries, and a lot of other areas. And some of these leading technology players like IBM's Watson's shown enormous potential in healthcare. They're able to mine medical records, look into new treatment designs and bespoke drug creation for the specific individual. And they're able to also automate a lot of the repetitive jobs and create avatars for clinical training and teleconsultation where you're looking at virtual representatives rather than having to use real persons to actually try to cut down on uh, the shortage of healthcare workers in this segment. And there are other areas like, for example, Google Mind, which has been looking into detecting and analyzing health risks using data collected and advanced predictive analytics by they have partnered the UK NHS, analyze all their medical images, hopefully be able to detect cancer even earlier than usual. And this is all made possible because of the increasing volumes of healthcare data via electronic health records, where we have increasing cloud-based applications, for example, the Azure platform by Microsoft, which is also a foolproof and scalable solution and cover the whole spectrum of clinical and non-clinical applications currently, including prevention, diagnostics, treatments, patient engagements, workflow processes, and claims processing. So there are other areas where you can see there is a lot of increasing AI work being done. For example, Analytic, a US-based medical imaging startup, is using deep learning technology in AI for tumor detection. As I mentioned, IBM Watson's is actually looking at applying cognitive AI technology to unlock the vast amounts of electronic health data to enable evidence-based diagnosis for medical personnel. And there's also other AI-powered healthcare assistant applications, those developed by Babylon Health and your MD, and even have robots with AI capabilities like surgical robots, especially in neurosurgery, is now relying on the AI that's made available by DeepMind and Watson's power uh, it in the first place. There's also Helix, an AI startup that uses machine learning to respond to verbal questions and requests. And another company called Patton, which uses AI with Crest and TensorFlow integration to be able to predict proteins structures in research and development. And what we have seen is that there's even a lot more of all these AI applications in the experimental phase. What I have mentioned here is only but a drop in the ocean currently, because there's so many players who have gotten on board. I will highlight that in more detail at a later stage. But currently there are some very interesting ones which are already involved. For example, GNS Healthcare, where they're using AI computer models of biomedical healthcare data to personalize medicines and treatment. It's helping ongoing research prevent, for example, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and cardiovascular diseases. There's also SimSMC, which is a therapy automation platform. which uses a virtual human interviewer that allows for deeper interactions with patients for diagnostic aids. And there's also Verb Surgical, 
uh, which is a collaboration between Con Johnson and Johnson and Alphabet, where they are building this surgical robot using machine learning and advanced visualization techniques. And if you can just have a quick look at how much the big Western countries are already investing in uh, AI in healthcare, you can see that, for example, it ranges from 10 to almost 20% of their gross domestic product. We're talking about billions of dollars. All these countries have already invested currently. And this is only like some of the early adoption areas based on what has the, uh, their own uh, medical markets have approved in terms of AI. Not even talking about all the startups and all the other emerging areas in AI, which are garnering a lot more investments currently. How about Malaysia, you ask? And this is where a recent uh, uh, conference of artificial intelligence in healthcare by our own Director General of Health has mentioned that this is ultimately necessary to make medical services better, faster, cheaper, and safer than what's been proven in other countries. What's even more encouraging is Karenik Clark, who is actually in charge of Philips for the whole Asian Pacific region, has mentioned that one of the biggest tasks that we have currently in Malaysia to digitize our health records. And they have noted there is a shortage of skills, skilled personnel. Uh, there are medical professionals who are trained in data science and AI so that they can assist in interpreting as well as managing the AI. Not only the universal access to healthcare, we felt, is truly within our reach right now, as well as been shown in a lot of the Western countries, where we can digitize the health records, we can upskill data science, and then using smart resource deployment, we are now able to make healthcare really accessible for everyone. So she feels that AI holds a lot of promise for ASEAN's developing countries. More importantly, all of these are available right now. We're not talking about something someone is thinking up as a very abstract conceptual uh, project. We're talking about real uh, uh, evidence-based applications which are already available that we have not implemented, fortunately. So for the first time ever, she felt that we are able to now potentially apply the knowledge of the world's best doctors utilizing this AI on a global scale for faster and more accurate diagnosis, especially if we start collaborating worldwide as well. Just to give you an idea of a successful AI venture in our own local setting, uh, you can Google him up. Essentially, Lim Menghui is the founder of Smart Tape AI. He has a PhD in electronic engineering from Korea and has worked, for example, with Microsoft Research Asia, developing AI platforms, and has been even teaching uh, in Hong Kong Baptist University as a professor there. And he's actually founded and developed a successful Malaysian AI startup, winning several local and international awards, even rated funding from Zero of AI, the Hong Kong-based accelerator for early-stage startups in AI, machine learning companies in Asia. They are currently, in fact, already selling evidence-based, self-developed false prevention and detection solutions using AI-powered cameras and thermal sensors placed in hospital rooms. A Shanghai-based market research firm called Facts and Factors, in fact, estimates this global AI market size will grow to potentially 300 billion in just the next uh, uh, about 10 years from 30 billion currently last year. So what are the AI technologies that we are aware of currently? So these are just four of the more common ones, but obviously this is not all that's available out there. There are a lot more, but uh, we will maybe discuss that in the question and answer later, because there's just too many for me to list out entirely. But the common ones are, for example, natural language processing, we are using machine learning for speech recognition, text analysis, translation, so that we are able to understand and classify clinical health records documentation, even able to 
analyze unstructured clinical notes on patients to understand the quality of it the, and improve the methods we use for better results and healthcare outcomes for our patients. And one of the companies that has been looking into this area is, for example, Intermountain Healthcare. There's also deep learning whereby we use machine learning to increase accuracy of our speech recognition, text analysis and translations, and even diagnosis and treatment of diseases, for example, that's what IBM Watson has been exploring for the last 50 years. And the deep learning AI technology can also potentially help the visually challenge, make sense of the environment around them. For example, we have existing computer vision and text-to-speech to narrate what is seen by the computer uh, verbally to the person who cannot see so that they can now be able to visualize in their mind based on the speech of what is actually around them. More importantly, it can also be used to identify facial cues of people nearby and study the surroundings and describe the environments and more importantly, prevent them from going to areas which may be dangerous for them in the first place. There's also context-aware processing, and these are seen as being used with the virtual assistant applications like Apple, Siri, Google Assistant, Amazon's Alexa, and even Microsoft's Cortana. And HealthTap or your MD have been using some of these technologies to find solutions to the most common medical symptoms these chatbots can act as enablers to direct the patients to the right position, diagnosis and therapy, or even to supplement the duties of an experienced doctor. There's also intelligent robotics, as I think some of you have mentioned earlier, and all these can be seen uh, as these robots which can help people stay healthy and also reduce hospitalization needs. And the beauty of that is some of them can be advanced humanoid designs of which they can feel like a uh, more uh, natural to especially like elderly patients to help them with continuing and increasing social interactions as well as conversations to prevent Alzheimer's setting in early. And some of these companion robots have in fact been commercialized, like for example, by Blue Frog Robotics, developer of Buddy, or the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, which is the developer of Paro. And on top of everything, even in the surgical field, robots which have greater flexibility and reach being used now in neurosurgery because they're able to make smaller incisions with even more precision and can use AI to prevent the common errors that has been done, such delicate surgery. There are also some more common applications like in the administrative side, where you can actually improve efficiency for claims processing, documentation, revenue cycle management, medical records, and you can use machine learning to correct coding issues and correct incorrect claims. And even as I mentioned earlier, analyze unstructured clinical notes, which can be very confusing for a non-clinician. So these are some of the examples of which AI has already been implemented within the healthcare environment. So there's healthcare data mining with AI to predict diseases. Like I mentioned DeepMind and Watson's are using patient data to mine the records to find insights and patterns from these large databases. They have a lot of potential, as they've shown, to have preventative intervention and earlier diagnosis of diseases and its complications so that you can stop the process before they actually develop, for example, a heart attack. There's also AI being used in medical imaging and diagnostics. For example, arteries, deep learning medical imaging technology company has partnered with General Electric, GE Healthcare, it combines arteries, quantification, and medical imaging technology with G Healthcare's energy reson resonance cardiac solutions to be able to complete these cardiac assessments in even shorter time compared to your typical 
smart contact scans, which can take sometimes up to an hour. There's also AI in lifestyle management and monitoring, which is completely changing and revolutionizing the way we live. For example, Fido, a startup, found a solution to encounter individuals' risk for lifestyle diseases and risk stratification algorithm using AI. So what that means is that it's able to predict someone's uh, 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 tendency for seven of the common non-communicable diseases, for example, type 2 diabetes and even myocardial infarction or heart attacks, and they're able to then give suggestions which are designed based on the individual as to how they can change their lifestyle to prevent this from progressing to a severe stage. Also, AI in nutrition, which is enhancing the journey to a healthy and fit lifestyle. And there is a VITL, a startup based in London, which is applying AI to diagnose a patient's nutritional needs and deficiencies. And they provide users with bespoke nutrition plans and even a daily vitamin pack, if necessary. So this AI engine uses Lana, which is Life and Adaptive Nutritional Advisor, which employs a broad range of lifestyle, entire data points to be able to design specifically a plan just for that individual. Also AI in emergency room and surgery, which is saving lives. And this has been seen since the first surgical robot developed which was known as the Da Vinci Surgical System, which has received FDA approval, general laparoscopic surgery, meaning they use keyholes, small little holes to perform the whole surgery. This was as early as 15 years ago. Currently, that has progressed even further using deep learning by Google and IBM. We are now able to use this advanced medical cognitive and natural language processing capabilities to respond to a surgeon's queries, which may be really important during the surgery itself. For example, it can monitor blood uh, pressures and other vital signs in real time, detect physiological responses to pain, and even provide 3D navigation support, arthroscopic or open surgery, which is essential to improving surgical outcomes currently. So, so AI in hospital information systems, which can enrich the delivery of healthcare services. For example, Google's DeepMind Health team is working with UK NHS hospitals to monitor a patient's conditions via a mobile application. They utilize predictive analytics in real time and source operational challenges across the whole hospital function, where they are able to reduce the number of steps taken to deal with a patient's condition and remove as much as possible paper-based processes to enable automated data collection, analysis, reporting, and even communication. Also AI used in research, which is providing fascinating insights. For example, adaptive biotechnologies start up addressing genomic-based therapy to partner with Microsoft to find out insights in immunosequence where they are able to now generate even a new class of immune diagnostics in cancer or oncology studies. There's also AI being developed for mental health, especially in building a strong support system for patients, especially since during the pandemic, it's going to be very challenging for people to get easy access to mental health care. So what, uh, what has been done, for example, WISA, AI-based emotionally intelligent penguin that was developed by Touchkin can actually listen, chat, and even help the users build up their mental health resilience. Within three months of its launch, Lisa actually saw a million chats with 50,000 users and assisted all of them to overcome their health, mental health troubles. And this is actually really important advancements because from WHO data, we know that at least one in four persons, 25% of the world, actually suffer from mental disorders. And they, these are people who feel lonely and need support of friends and psychiatric therapists. And this is where AI can potentially offer some help, especially with the difficulty we have 
face to face contact right now. So, so AI in pharmaceutical sciences, where it enables new classes of diagnostics, treatment discovery, and BRG, a pharmaceutical startup, has created an AI platform that uses biological data, cells, transforming from healthy to malignant ones. So they have been utilizing the genome, human genome project data in 2003 and over 14 trillion data points in a single patient cell tissue in the development of new cancer therapies that can potentially reverse and even stop the cancer process. Also AI technology in virtual assistance to communicate with patients in an efficient way. So no one's a company has developed a medical virtual assistant, streamlines clinical workflows for almost half a million clinicians who are using the Dragon Medical every day for their clinical documentation. This makes life a lot more efficient so that doctors can focus on actually treating the patients rather than writing down their notes. That's also very exciting uh, developments. I'm sure all of you guys are aware. Wearables like smartwatches, clothes, I choose is able to help us make proactive decisions to be healthier. Textum, for example, will be able to help you design some of these uh, devices from ground up for medical applications and even integrate it to existing services like Alexa, Siri, and so on. The Internet of Things with medical equipment, which are linked to apps and then linked to healthcare IT systems will potentially generate an internet of health things in the future. And this variable AI market has been shown in the States to be growing potentially from 11 billion in 2018 to 42 billion in 2023 as reported by Markets and Markets, one of the data analytics companies in the States. What's really encouraging is, as you can see here, this is just a brief list of all the currently existing companies who are increasing the amount of jobs in AI area per se. And these companies are located all over the world, with some of them even available in Malaysia currently. And if you look at the big tech companies, which are also uh, uh, having some of their offices here, Google, IBM, you can see that they are investing a lot of money where Google has invested 0.6 billion in DeepMind and IBM has invested 1 billion more in other areas which are not disclosed. Even Intel has invested almost half a billion in acquiring uh, uh, AI systems, Apple has also invested 1.2 billion in acquiring AI services for uh, healthcare in the first place. And this is all like data from years ago, obviously newer data uh, and newer acquisitions, which are not included here because they are still being discussed at the current moment. So what I'm going to do at this stage in time is just to introduce you to what we are doing in UM. And I would like to invite currently uh, my students, uh, Nicholas and uh, Tiong Chong Ken, to actually help present some of the work that we're doing in UM currently. And hopefully this might uh, allow you to see uh, some of the exciting things and maybe even uh, drive you or motivate you to join us in building this currently. So Nicholas, if you would just like to uh, kick off the presentation, thank you. Hey, good morning um, to everyone here. Um, it's, uh, I'm glad to be here and so uh, I will be presenting about this AI in healthcare. So this is what our team is working on. Um, hello, plus at UM. Uh, yeah. So our team is three people: me, Su Ching, and Xiong Kian. Um, so Doctor Ng is our lecturer, and he's responsible for our team. Um, so I'll play this video to to 
demonstrate what we are building right now. Um, can you guys hear it? Uh, Nicholas, I think you actually need to uh, include the sound when you share it because I can't hear the sound. Is the leading infectious cause? Is it better? Yeah, I can now. Okay, thank you. According to the WHO, tuberculosis is the leading infectious cause of death worldwide. In 2019, 10 million fell ill with it and 1.4 million died. 25% of TB patients default to treatment every year, costing us 51 million ringgit a year due to higher infection rates, more complications and deaths. What if we could change that in this region for the first time ever? Hello, I'm Umi, your personal assistant, and welcome to Hello at UM. Together with us, you can help change the course of TB treatment in the ASEAN region. Here's how. In Hello at UM, we believe convenience equals compliance. We are the newest go-to for TB video, directly observed therapy strategy, or VDOCS. This is how it's going to work. Medications will be delivered to you with instructions provided. Upload your DOCS video as instructed. Your data will be stored securely in your electronic medical records. It is only accessible by your healthcare provider. Should you experience any side effects, please follow the instructions on how you can seek further help. If you have any queries, you can ask me for help in the chat box. It's that easy. These features will also be going into an app, which will be open to developers. Due to increased convenience and safety, 80% of patients and 90% of UM Medical Center staff support VDOTS. Through the Lean Startup model, we'll be utilizing existing infrastructure and services. We're making this self-sustaining. In fact, we should break even from the first year itself and increase profits progressively through website subscriptions, advertisements, and other related methods. In other words, Hello at UM could save 40.3 billion ringgit in the long run by increasing treatment compliance. We anticipate problems such as data breaches, health literacy of users, and patients re-uploading all the videos. Thus, we are working on preventive measures. Our VDOT system is the first in the region. It offers many advantages, such as cost effectiveness and better treatment compliance on top of existing benefits. We have also obtained letters of intent from multiple departments in UMMC, as well as the Ministry of Health for further expansion. We also intend to partner with the state government's cash incentive for patients who complete DOT therapy. Imagine being able to access quality healthcare from a top-notch institution from the comforts of your own home. We could achieve the WH and TB by 2030 goal with accessible healthcare and in the process eradicate the risks of COVID-19. We are proud to present our platform to the world. Goodbye for now. Or should we say hello? According to the W This is how our app will work in detail. Um, so, sorry, I don't think you guys can't hear it, right? Uh, Nicholas, I think uh, it actually doesn't have a voice. So oh, you okay. can just play to just show how it works as well. Yeah, okay, sorry. No worries. So this is the login page and um, it, it demonstrates what the app can do. Um, yeah, so this is the login to create a new account. So this is just a sample of what we are intending to do. Um, so his, this is the v, -dot, v dots therapy, which enables the patients to 
have their own medication instead of going to the hospital. So after they take the medication, they will, um, it will be recorded down in their calendar so that they can keep, their, keep track of their progress and the hospital is able to keep track also. They are also able, this is the medicine shop, so they can buy medicines here and um, it will be delivered to their own home. You can also book an appointment with your doctors through the calendar also, instead of like calling the clerk and to liars with the clerk. So it'll be easier on everyone. So these are the side effects reporting for the, for the medications if any and you are able to access your own account to confirm that this is your account okay, so this is all for the app um, yeah thank you thanks nicholas uh lydia would you mind presenting uh, about your team's work with Alzheimer's? Yeah, sure. All right, thanks. So let me share my screen. Fatima, you can start. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, can hear yes, you. Can. Go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone. We are Alzheimer at UM, and we are on a mission to build affordable, age-friendly app, changing the world for a better life. To help you understand a better idea of what our goal is, let's meet Mr. Ben. Mr. Ben is a 70-year-old man who lives with his wife after retiring 10 years ago. He has been spending most of his time at home because of the current pandemic and has a even fewer chances of going out and meeting his friends after the restrictions have been lifted. When he finally meet his friends, he has trouble remembering their names and sometimes finding his way home. To help him remember things uh, from the past, he looked back at his diary and his wife realizes that his handwriting appears to be smaller than what it used to be. Because of this, he is worried that he might be having early signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. However, up till now, there are no reliable early detection tests of the disease that he can test by himself. He would like to do some tests on his own before consulting a professional. Worrying about Alzheimer's disease, Mr. Ben learns that 75% of people living with dementia are undiagnosed and delayed in identification because of COVID-19. One in three clinicians still believe nothing can, could be done and every three seconds we have one Alzheimer's patient. The estimated cost for treatment and care is around $1.5 trillion in 2021 only. Next slide. For early detection, we have MMSE, which is Mini Mental State Exam, and MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. But these methods are not sensitive enough at early stages of dementia and require other equipment. All Alzheimer's patients have different types of treatment and care costs. Therefore, Alzheimer is a solution to lower the burden of the caregiver by 50%. The initial target is 800 patients from UMMC alone. Then we will expand to the whole Malaysia, which is around 50,000 people. And last but not least, 50 million people worldwide. Introducing Alzheimer at UM, 
Our solution to transport tra transform traditional paper diagnostic methods to an AI detection. Therefore, we provide retinal scan for early detection. We also provide word usage analysis to detect the possibility of getting Alzheimer's disease. From now on, I'm going to pass to Lydia. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. <clears throat> Targeting all Alzheimer and non-Alzheimer patients in Malaysia, UMMC will be our first customer as we have secured letters of intent and strong market feedback support from their staff and patients. Beyond UMMC, our target partners are Ministry of Health, KKM hospitals and private hospitals in Malaysia, as well as healthcare institutions. Expansion and adaption of our platform to worldwide Alzheimer patients is also in our long-term goals. Optical Diagnostic is our overseas direct competitors, while Constant Therapy, Dementia Friend, and Alzheimer Scotland are our indirect competitors, but they are no existing local competitors. Based on the table, we can clearly see that Alzheimer has a lot of advantages compared to other apps in the market, as we are providing an all-in-one platform for Alzheimer patients and non-Alzheimer patients. This is our revenue module that targeting for three phases. For the first phase, we are targeting 2,700 people, which including healthy people and Alzheimer's patients. When we move on to the phase two, we are targeting 4,700 people. For the third phase, we will open to the public, which target 1,225,500 people. Before we end, a quick shout out to all my teammates and our technical, medical, and business expert supervisor who have supported us to bring this idea to reality. So now, let us take you through the journey of Azaba at UM. Thank you. Thanks, Lydia. And Xu Qing, could you kindly uh, introduce the work that we're doing with palliative care? Yes, sure. Okay. So very good afternoon to everyone. So other than tuberculosis and Alzheimer's. Our team is also working on palliative care. Today, I would like to share about how my team is going to help change this area of medical care through the development of telehealth mobile phone application. So palliative care is an area of medical care which aims to improve the quality of life and to preserve the dignity of patients suffering from physical and psychological symptoms resulting from debilitating Debilitative care in Malaysia is essential to create a safety net for everyone suffering from the illness. However, currently in Malaysia, especially those in the rural areas, have little to no access to palliative care. Next slide, please. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic made visits to hospital more ris risky and restricted. Hence, this is where, hence this is where our telehealth mobile phone application for palliative care. Uh, being one of the potential solutions to the shortage of palliative care services in the rural area and remote monitoring services steps in. Patients or caregivers will report their symptoms through the application and the palliative care doctors will access their symptoms uh, daily. Teleconsultation or home visits will also be arranged as necessary based on the symptoms reported and appropriate treatment will be prescribed to the concerning patient. This in turn helps to reduce unnecessary visits to the hospital. With the incorporation of AI to automate the process, healthcare workers can also channel the expertise elsewhere, increasing the efficiency. So here in Malaysia, we are also currently lacking in ICT available to improve standards and monitor standards of palliative care medicine. Therefore, with our telehealth mobile phone application, our team aims to enhance patient data registries, auditing, providing education and tracking of palliative care activities throughout the nation. Our application could also be used as a platform for data gathering to enhance future research as well as to provide education for medical personnel. Next slide, please. So here we have our three main industry competitors who offer similar application or services available in Malaysia. So they are Doc to us, Telemi and Doctor on call. Next slide, please. Even though they might be similar applications or services which are already in the market, they are nowhere near the palliative telehealth mobile phone application that we are going to develop due to the various shortcomings mentioned above. Next slide, please. 
So we will be the first fully integrated health resources in Malaysia. The palliative telehealth mobile phone application will be a game changer for population in the rural areas throughout Malaysia who are in need of palliative care services because as for now, there are no remote, remote telehealth platform from any of the tertiary hospital or university hospital which can serve them. So here above is all the uh, is what we are our team is doing right now and uh, my sharing ends here. Thank you. Thank you, Shu Ching. So just to bring this all together, essentially we feel currently in Malaysia the greatest challenge to AI in healthcare not whether the technologies we have will be capable enough to be useful, as that's already proven in many other Western countries, rather ensuring the adoption in our daily clinical practice. And in time, with AI being able to automate all our repetitive tasks, we may finally migrate towards tasks, require more unique human skills, tasks that require the highest level of cognitive function. And last but not least, I would quote from Winston Churchill, the fact that this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Key, for that insightful keynote session. And to the student speakers, Nicholas, Lydia, Fatima, and Chu Ching for sharing your projects with us. It was amazing. Um, a note to all participants, if you have any questions, please post them via the slider link in the chat box. And without further ado, we'll begin the keynote session. I mean, sorry, the Q&A session. All right, we'll begin with the first question. So coming from a tech background, do we need knowledge about medicine to get into the medical field? Uh, Lydia, would you like to uh, answer that? Since you're from the IT background as well. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, from my perspective, I don't think so we really need to have the knowledge, but at least we have the basic idea of how is it works. So when we de develop our project and then maybe we can have an interview sessions with the, <clears throat> with, uh, with, with the user so that we can really know that what is their problem. Instead of you just looking on the materials online, you just know it, but you don't understand it. Yeah, I think that's all for me. Thank you. I think maybe just to add a little bit on that in the sense that uh, at the end of the day, majority of the people in fact who are working in AI in healthcare are non-medical because the physicians themselves traditionally are more used to a hands-on practice, not as familiar in AI. To answer that question succinctly, essentially you don't need to be in a, to have a medical background. Obviously, if you have a medical background, that will be even more uh, uh, strong on your side in terms of development. So then you understand all the various aspects. That's what Lydia has rightly shared. Just because you don't have a medical background doesn't mean that you can't. It's just that uh, you may need to partner or collaborate with others with a medical background, that's all. Thank you for that answer. I think that also answers the, the second, second question. Second question, yeah, pretty yes. much. Okay, so we'll move on to the third question. What are your thoughts on the advancement of technology in the healthcare sector? Do you think that AI could help doctors improve the accuracy of diagnosis? Well, thank you for the question. I think uh, this is a, a question that's already been uh, uh, shown very well with Google DeepMind as well as IBM Watson's. But they are able to come up even at this current early stage of their development and up to its 75% accuracy in terms of diagnostics. And this is actually uh, even more uh, clear 
and you're talking about big data diagnostics, for example, MRI scans of the heart, as what I've discussed earlier, or even uh, slightly more complicated scans like functional magnetic resonance imaging, the brain, which I used to work with in King's College in London. And what we've seen is that AI can potentially assess the really large data sets, be able to highlight to doctors which are the areas which they feel are the most relevant, even based on very, very small changes, which some of the less well-trained doctors may not pick up in the first place. What is really important is with the application of AI in all these areas, like for example, in imaging, you can actually level the playing field because a lot of this um, training that doctors need it's based on a lot of experience of looking at different uh, x-rays, for example. And the only way you can kind of level that to some extent is to have an AI technology which can highlight to these doctors there may be something going on there to just prompt them to look harder and to continue investigating further to verify whether if there really is cancer, for example, something else that's causing the problem. This will then allow even junior doctors to be as efficient or as uh, 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 perceptive as the more senior doctors who traditionally will be much better compared to junior doctors in diagnosing x-ray related or like you know very data intensive related uh, diagnostics. So would it be possible to say that with the help of AI, it sort of acts as a, a backup to, to confirm the diagnosis or possibly correct a false diagnosis. Yes, uh, not only it acts as a backup, in fact, it can also look for differences that we may not pick up so easily because you're talking about, for example, X-ray images, which has a, a contrast range of about 5,000. When you're talking about such a wide contrast range, the small contrasts may not be so clearly seen because all this data is now digitized. So using AI, you can look at even small contrast changes which will be picked up by AI but may not necessarily be picked up with the naked human eye. That's the catch. Because we are still you know, limited by, for example, uh, the eye conditions we have, the health condition of uh, our doctors on that day, even, for example, the uh, 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 screen that we are using to view the x-rays in the first place. If any of these things are not ideal, you may not pick up the changes straight away. As AI will not actually be dependent on any of this, it will only depend on the actual raw data itself, which is where it can play a really important part. And obviously, it will also reduce the amount of false diagnosis because it can then uh, highlight to doctors where they might miss certain changes in the x-rays in the first place. And this has been clearly documented to work very well in a lot of uh, UK as well as American countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, what are your thoughts on medical nanobots? Okay, I have to uh, 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 say I'm not a nano uh, tech guy, I'm a medical uh, uh, person. What I can hazard in terms of what uh, I've heard is, for example, there are already uh, medical nanobots in uh, development currently. One of the interesting ones that we've seen with regards to uh, where they can actually use nanobots, try to actually uh, uh, check blood clots, which I'm sure some of you have heard can be very common in COVID-19. And on top of everything, it can also repair, for example, vessels which are leaking because of these blood clots or other problems in that local vicinity. The only catch is all this is still like at very early stages of development. As far as I know, none of them are actually FDA approved. And uh, at the end of the day, again, 
because all these are still robotics. And you know, robotics potentially can still have errors. This is where we are still really careful in terms of how we are going about it in the first place, due to the fact that there's just too much unknowns in the developmental areas currently. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next is, what advice would you give to students from data science backgrounds who would like to go into the healthcare industry? Okay, maybe I'm a bit shamelessly plugging my group, but like the first thing I think you should do is join a community of practice like ours, get hands-on work experience. More importantly, get involved in the area straight away. Ideally, uh, you could actually go for what they call double majors, like what is really common in America, whereby they actually do a uh, healthcare major as well as data science major at the same time. Or there's even a new area whereby they are developing in the States as well, uh, which is getting more popular now. Uh, they are doing what they call an MD, PhD. So they do their doctor of medicine and their doctorate in philosophy, which means they are research clinical scientists from the word go itself. And they are, a lot of them, sub-specialized in very new areas like this. I have to say that is a lot of investment and a lot of time because your MD itself takes four years. The PhD would take another three years. We're talking about seven years of studying after you graduate from your bachelor's. But it is what they practice in America, to be fair. I wouldn't say it's not a good way to go about it because it gives you the best training and exposure. Ultimately, if you really want to combine the two, both degrees will be very, very important. But at this current stage, without having to spend too much, without uh, uh, having more resources, the easiest way I will feel is to join a project or a team who are already working in these areas so that you can gain the experience as well as the exposure, hopefully even international exposure like they are in a team or in the Microsoft Imaging Cup the National Hackathon. So I think that would also apply to um, students in the healthcare industry already. Like oh, same as well, pretty much. I think students who in healthcare who are trying to get into data science, you know, they, because it's really hard if you want to try to get two majors and no people who have tried, they literally didn't see the sun for the next three years, four years of their degree. And I wouldn't advise that for everyone because not everyone will survive that. A good and uh, very uh, easy step for you to take right now is just to get involved in some of the work straight away, either in your university or as I mentioned, you're more than welcome. Contact us and also join us in our site where we are running all these projects already. We are currently in quite a lot of development, building this up in the first place. For those who may have interest, we are at the moment also building what they call virtual uh, patients, whereby people can learn about how to go about getting healthcare information, even simple examination and treatment in a virtual environment rather than in a real uh, life patient. This is also another budding industry, especially in the healthcare sector, due to the fact that you don't want to expose your students to potential COVID. So it's actually a much better situation if you can have more virtual patients for them to practice first, only have targeted real life patients, them to see now and then, make sure they actually develop the right uh, uh, skills for their clinical practice. But this way, you can actually minimize the risk, yet have the equal level of training all the students, which is what we are developing in UM as well. Great. That's actually very fascinating to, to be able to apply that virtually due to the pandemic. All right. Um, I think the next question is, do you think computer science students should work with medical science students to come up with this project that could um, be beneficial? Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, Nicholas, would you like to take this maybe?
Right. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't see why not, because computer science students, we, because our app also mainly focus on uh, a lot of programming and stuff to program the app. So I feel like computer science students can also be an asset. Um, and we also can learn, uh, for me as a medical student, I, we also can learn a lot from computer science students as well as the other way around. So uh, I feel that it will be beneficiary for both ways. Um, and I feel like um, it can help the app a lot with their expertise and our knowledge of um, healthcare. Yeah. So as I mentioned to you guys earlier, um, you could get two degrees, which is what people are doing in the States. But as I uh, also said that, you know, it's not always a practical option, simply due to the cost and the time involved. You're looking at seven years of studies after you finish your bachelor's in the first place. And that is not even uh, guaranteeing that you uh, pass through in the first place. It is a very challenging program. Very high failure rates are ultimately. So what we recommend, obviously, is to, in fact, work in a large collaborative group. This is where we come in. And uh, in fact, uh, I think Nicholas, uh, Lydia, uh, they've actually been presenting in various conferences. In fact, recently we presented at ITEX 2021 just last week. Why you could see the amalgamation of so many different uh, 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 people who are looking at AI in healthcare. Their teams all comprise of multiple areas, meaning that you have people who are in business trying to commercialize the product so it becomes self-sustaining, can have something that actually can run for the possible future. And you have people in medical who are trying to make sense of what you're trying to apply for the AI. You also have people in computer science, people in mathematics, as a matter of fact, because of all the advanced analytics that you're going to perform. And more importantly, you also want people who are kind of like in the preventative medical area can assist and give you advice how you can now make sense of all this big data. And last but not least, also want people who are kind of like uh, uh, in the IT and coding area, see how we can actually make this uh, in the most efficient way, in a very practical manner, meaning that you don't want to invest too much time and resources building something too complicated when you have an easier option in the first place. More importantly, we also need people in AI, which our team has as well, as I mentioned, the successful startup team, uh, which is Smart Peep AI, Johor, are in fact collaborating with us, guiding our students on how to design and write uh, AI algorithms to actually assist us in our digital health platform. And with such a diverse group, we can then start looking into building a digital health platform it can potentially be quite useful to patients. More importantly, have input from all the various sectors, which can ultimately help to ensure the patients get the most benefit. So yes, and uh, in fact, not only we should work together, we actually need to expand the whole group to as large as possible to look at all the various aspects. Because you can treat one thing, but if only looking at one thing and missing out all the rest, essentially it's just the patient that suffers. Because would they want 10 different apps? look at 10 different things for their disease or would they prefer a single app that looks at everything okay great thank you for putting it so concisely uh, okay. the next question is do you think ai robots could be used for emergencies in saving lives in the future well uh, i don't know if you saw some of the examples i gave you earlier in fact ai is already being used in emergency setting uh, in the States. And they are used in various areas. Like for example, in the UK, what they are using AI initially is to in fact talk to patients first before they even arrive in the hospital. This triaging system also happens in the hospital itself. On top of everything, they actually have AI robots which are in the emergency room providing certain uh, emergency uh, uh, interventions 
surgically in the emergency department itself because that actually allows much more advanced technologies and surgical techniques to be provided and made available to all the emergency settings other than only in very tertiary centers like ours where you have the best trained surgeons in the world. This is uh, where we see potentially might change practice for all the hospitals when they can afford it, where all these hospitals can get access to life-saving surgical interventions, which are robotic-based in the first place. As I mentioned, a lot of these are still in development, but not actually uh, uh, ready right now for general rollout, unfortunately. But they have been showing quite good results we do hope and suspect this is not too far away in the future. Okay, fantastic. Um, the next question is, in the field of nutrition, do you think it's possible to monitor dietary habits to fine-tune dietary recommendations? Well, we are already doing that. And if you look at any of your apps, whether Android or uh, 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 Apple-based, you see there are probably more than 100 different apps which are trying to offer nutrition advice. The one I actually mentioned is VITL, which is actually a startup based in London because that's where I used to work. I'm more familiar with that. And what it does is you just need to essentially take photos of your food every day based on that and whatever data you tell it, whether you're diabetic, you're hypertensive, or if you have any other problems like high cholesterol or even gout, for example, it will then calculate what you're taking in, looking at your clinical background, and then ultimately arrange for what kind of specific dietary recommendations just for you and you alone, and even send you vitamins or supplements if they feel is necessary based on what you've been showing them for your daily diet, which will ultimately correct all these nutritional deficiencies to help you maintain better health in the long run. Okay, great. Um, next is, based on the project, do the medical students work together with the computer science students to build the application? Um, maybe we can get uh, Lydia to answer this as well. So uh, maybe you can explain to them, Lydia, your experience working with medical students, building our app that we've been showing to them in the first place. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so for, before I answer this question, let me introduce a bit of myself. So um, <clears throat> I'm a computer, computer science student. So basically I only know technology side. I don't have any knowledge about the medical things. So, you, <clears throat> so I think uh, all of you have seen the uh, introducing of Hello at UM about the TB, TB apps. I read that one I, I have a uh, group with the medical student to build it out. They will give us like how the they will give us the perspective like as a patient, how to use the app and what kind of what kind of situation they will feel. So, so as a technical teams, we know that what we should need to adjust and need to build for it. Because if for my <clears throat> for my opinion, right, because I'm from technical side, so normally I will just build the things like what I think on me. I won't care about like how others. Like, like how the patients feel. I think oh, this is awesome and then this is the coolest thing that I, that I like and so I will just feel based on it. So if you team with the medical student, it will be very beneficial because they will give a lot of uh, knowledge and opinion to you so we can see like how others think of it. Yeah, I think that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks Lydia for sharing. Uh, as you can see, essentially, the collaborations are really important. And I think the other parts that she's not really uh, explained as much. Also the fact that we've actually had professors from all over 
to discuss what we are building and they have given us very good input sometimes which actually helps how you can build the app to make it the most user-friendly possible because there are a lot of things that not all of us can uh, sort of like uh, 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 understand from the word go especially when it comes to app development and another thing which i feel is really working very well for us is the fact that as we are building the app we are also feeding back and interviewing our patients on a regular basis and getting their opinions of how they feel the app should be like and whether if what we're building is something they might actually use in the first place. This regular assessments, reassessments, also adjusting based on the uh, uh, patient-centric approach is actually ultimately very useful and has allowed us to build an uh, app that seems to be very uh, accepted widely both professionals, clinicians, and also patients. Okay, great. So the next question is, the use of AI in personalized medication is lucrative, but is this affordable to the general population? Wouldn't the gathering of epigenomic data be too costly? Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are already readily available data like the human genome project which is available to all researchers at no cost obviously there are and there will always be cost involved when you're trying to personalize medicine but this is where the uh, research institutes can come in and because we are also developing this as part of uh, our learning process we're actually more than keen to fund the process. This is where I think UM sometimes has a bit of advantage, the sense that we actually get access to a lot of these uh, new research treatments as well as personalized medicine, which may not be available anywhere else in Malaysia because it's actually not licensed yet. What we're hoping to do is as we actually make the technology more and more widely used and available, the cost of the technology itself will automatically become cheaper and cheaper. It's the same as how smartphones used to be something that you know, only someone who is really rich or can afford it is only able to access. And there were still a lot of people who did not have access to that until not too many years ago. You can see now you can get a smartphone for like free sometimes if you're subscribing to the service or even as cheap as 400 ringgit and you know it's not something that happened overnight as you see wider and wider adoption of the technology you will also see the reduction of the cost of the technology which is where this will go which is where we hope this will go as well Uh, and finally, we're at our last question. Uh, will you be developing your project ideas and pitch it to investors to help make your projects a reality? Thank you for the question. Not quite related to what we're doing, but uh, what I'm hoping to do, in fact, with this project, because we are more of a social enterprise, to be fair, not businessmen. We are clinicians, we are IT people, as well as medical students and also professors from different backgrounds. So what we hope to do is to build a self-sustaining system, which is why if you looked at what we were trying to uh, uh, discuss earlier, all our projects are based on a subscription service, because ultimately you can then subscribe to the service that you need and only pay for that service, which makes it more affordable. More importantly, you only pay for when you're using it can stop the subscription at any point in time, which means stop having access to that service. But what's more important is you can also increase your subscription based on your needs as well. In case, for example, you need the cardiology module, you need the Alzheimer's module, just need to pay 10 to each to get access to both the modules. So even if you get access to, let's say, 10 or 20 modules, talking about maybe 100 to 200 ringgit, is still ultimately quite affordable to most people compared to coming to the clinic itself 
does one clinic visit, because we are all specialists here, to pay a minimum of 15 ringgit just for the clinic, not to mention the rest of the services and things like that. This is where our project can potentially become self-sustaining with the patients. And it takes a load off the hospital as well, because the patients will decide themselves if they want to take charge of their health in the first place and get access to all of this. We have, in fact, already been pitching our ideas several hackathons and have had a good success. In the NUS Grand Medical Final Challenge, we, in fact, were in the top 10 uh, teams. And in the latest uh, Chita Hackathon app development uh, uh, competition, we were placed in the top six. And we actually won the UM Deep Tech competition and the latest ITEX uh, competition as well. We were awarded the Gold Award uh, for our project. And uh, currently, we do have some uh, industrial collaborators already starting to work with us with regards to, for example, uh, app development, branding and marketing, and even the AI technology, as I mentioned, Smart Beep AI. It's already in collaboration with us to try to build this for the long term. Thank you. Congratulations on your project. Um, and thank you to Dr. Key for answering all our questions.